Hey. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing good. This uh, FaceTime thing's kind of weird. <laughs> Got to tell you, I'm not used to it. Not used to FaceTime as a whole or? Ever. Yeah, I don't use it. I don't use it. This is weird. I don't like looking at myself while I talk. <laughs> I it's I feel like it's really weird for me to to not be able to see the person I'm talking to because I feel like especially when you're when you're doing the audio part the the miscues of when someone's talking or thinking or whatever you're like are hello did you break up did, are we gone so it's, right. that happens quite a bit so I try to to do this so at least I can actually see the person uh, I get it on your end on my yeah. end it sucks yeah I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry <laughs> it's all right <laughs> gotta say I think this is probably the most nervous I've actually been talking to anybody. Do not be nervous. Smoke some weed. Let's do this. <laughs> um, so I'm I'm really not going to focus on kill switch shit like at all. Yeah, as far good. as like actual band stuff, just more how it correlates to uh, graphic design and so forth. Um, okay. And then just for future reference, because I, I will bring this up. I figured I'd show you this if you could actually see it. It's my uh, poster for a show I did, but I have a love of horror movies as well. So it's uh, Phantasm. One of the yeah, it's great. That's European cool. uh, versions of the movie poster, but I've also been trying to get better about when I reference something instead of trying to be like, "Hey, hold on a second and let me show you." Uh, <laughs> I'm doing it okay. beforehand. Um, do you have you... a hard out at all? Like, do you need to be done like in an hour? Like, I don't plan on taking much more than like an hour, hour and a half. Yeah, an hour would be good. Um, okay, I got some stuff. I gotta go. I'm doing this weird symphony symphony thing tonight. Uh, going with a friend to go see a symphony, so I gotta get ready at some point. Okay. All right, we'll hop right into it then. I have the pleasure of uh, chatting with Mike D of Kill Switch Engage, Dark Icon Design, and a slew of other bands that are sort of present in the scene at this point, whether it be Overcast or Death Ray Vision. And I think you even have one more that I'm blanking on, but men of many bands over the last 20 some odd years. I have ideas for other bands, but those are it Over Overcast, Death Ray Vision, and uh, Kill Switch, really. So the reason I wanted to talk to you is because you've had a, while having a very successful music career, it's it's a lot of the other things you've done in your design work that I've found very interesting. And, and I know some people tend to kind of talk about it, but I don't, I've never actually found an at length conversation about it. It's very quick and to the point. And I understand that's how a lot of print and or quick interviews are. So uh, I wanted to kind of delve into that with you if uh, we can. Sure. But my memory recall on old projects sucks. We'll, That's fine. We'll try I, it out. <laughs> try not to be so super specific about if it. If I have it listed, I can tell you about exactly what happened in each project, but um, I don't have my cliff notes for this interview. <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's uh, let's start with the very beginning. What got you interested in in, in artwork as growing up? Um, well, I went to a vocational high school. My parents forced me to go into a vocational high school because I said I didn't want to go to college. I said I never would. Uh, little did I know, once I was done with high school, that's all you want to do is like not be in the real world. <laughs> so very true. I did go on to college, but um, they wanted me to get a career, obviously uh, a smart thing for them to try and push me towards. Um, I wasn't really receptive to it. Um, technical high schools are usually known as being kind of bad places. And mine was notoriously awful for getting, you know, people <laughs> getting beat up during lunch and people getting smacked with um cafeteria trays and knifings and all sorts of really fun stuff like that. But <laughs> I, I survived. Um, so I went through that. There's a thing called um, um, Prevoke where they okay. introduce you to every shop. And I really liked um, commercial art, but I really cannot draw at all. And the next best thing is graphic design. I, I remember being in the graphic design shop and um, my friends saying, oh man, we need to get stickers made for our band can you do it? And I said, yeah, absolutely. I have that facility. Uh, I could definitely make that happen. And um, just kind of started working with bands right off the bat, sneaking things on the press and um, <laughs> taking photos of things in the big wall camera and, and blowing it up to posters for, for people and then onto flyers and, and uh, seven inch covers and stuff like that. So it kind of stemmed from being pushed into a career that I wasn't sure I wanted to do. And being friends with a lot of bands that I thought, I actually thought the band stuff seemed a lot more fun. But um, now I think design is more fun. <laughs> uh, something that I, in kind of doing the research on you and, and watching a bunch of various interviews uh, and 
for those eventually that may be able to see behind your head, you have a uh, skateboard. I know you were big into skateboarding as a whole, the the culture, and I kind of wondered how much of a lot of early skateboarding, the the designs and the and the the streetwear and stuff like that, how much of that kind of influenced you in your earlier graphic design work, or even still? Huge. Oh, huge. Um, David Carson, um, well-known graphic designer who was 20 years ahead of his time, who liked grime and dirty stuff all the time, um, cutting and pasting and all sorts of uh, real life style paste up stuff um, instead of doing any. I mean, back then there was no computers anyways, but he, he did a lot of cut and paste and really fun cool stuff that was way ahead of its time. And, and uh, he used to do stuff for, uh, uh, let's see, he did a little bit for Thrasher, mostly Transworld skateboarding. Um, and I think Transworld surfing maybe. And um, I just loved his artwork. I remember trying to make ads for myself to be <laughs> like pseudo sponsored by OJ2 wheels or whatever. And I, I really played up to a lot of stuff that he was doing and, and uh, always tried to focus in on, um, you know, different in intricacies of stuff that he would do. And uh, I love it. So uh, the graphics back then, nice, big, bold. Um, Jim Phillips was a big influence of mine, even though he was an illustrator and I am not. Uh, I just write, like the big boldness, the really black, dark outlines, sort of um, tattoo style of really bold stuff. Um, John Lucero was a big hero of mine, um, another illustrator. I mean, most of my illustrators, I guess, are, are, I mean, most of my heroes are illustrators, but I'm not an illustrator. I wish I could. Um, Is it something you've actually tried to your hand at and just aren't good at just, it? As yeah, much? I, I guess maybe I'm too much of a perfectionist. I look just like <laughs> doing the, the most rudimentary drawings ever and making them as funny as possible so it's usually <laughs> stick figures uh with their finger in their nose giving you giving you the finger or, um holding up a dog or something dumb like that i just can't do it um but yeah skateboarding was was uh very much a part of my life i used to leave high school and go skateboarding the rest of the day till you know nine ten o'clock at night and on the weekends i would skate 12 hours a day every day and it was just something um unique because i came from a uh, background of my dad uh and my mom pushed me towards sports and uh team activities and i just was never a team guy i i got into karate at an early age and liked the soloness of doing stuff rather than having to ha have have a million people come over and then you can actually do the thing you want to do. Um, I just like doing it by myself. So skateboarding was really fun in that way that you could just go outside and skate by yourself and just get rid of a lot of problems and, and um, kill a lot of energy that may have been pent up. And uh, much like hardcore, um, I would go to hardcore shows and you could uh, jump in the pit when I would jump in the pit and, um, <laughs> and just get rid of a lot of that pent up aggression that maybe your parents weren't nice to you and didn't get you that robot that you wanted or, <laughs> or, uh, you know, stupid stuff like that. Dumb stuff when you're a kid that you think is way more important than it actually is. Um, was there ever a particular, uh, skateboarder that had a, a style, whether it be the stuff on his signature decks or the clothes that maybe he came out with that you also kind of identified with? I see you have a Tony Alva board behind you. Um, mm -hmm. and obviously each of the Z boys had kind of their own unique style, like between Jay Adams and Alva and the rest of the people, Peralta and all them. Yeah. I was always a Paul Peralta guy. I think it was just the age that I grew up in and their, um, Bones Brigade video two future primitive, uh, had a huge influence on me and it just showed you that you didn't have to be really good and you could still have a lot of fun skateboarding. <laughs> uh, you could plow through the grass or drive, you know, drive down a hill on your skateboard. And it was just, it made it less of a sport and more of a fun thing to do. And, uh, yeah, Powell guys, Tony Hawk, uh, Mike McGill, Rodney Mullen is my favorite of all time just cause he invented every street trick imaginable these days. Seems like he still um, is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Steve Caballero, um, um, Tommy Guerrero there. Uh, I'm a huge fan of those guys. And especially, Animal Chin, the third Power Peralta video, um, was my ultimate video ever. Another thing that I, I know about you, and I've wondered how it has affected 
your love of graphic design and so forth and just art is your love of wrestling. And I know you, from what I understand, I would assume you were like me and, and watched wrestling in the 80s, which basically just would have been WWE, maybe some WCW. I know out on the East Coast, uh, since we were like, I'm originally from Delaware. So I remember being able to get feeds from like uh, TBS of like WCW and AWA and all that kind of stuff. But am I wrong in that thinking that uh, wrestling back then, even with some of this, the bold characters and the colors and stuff that, that they would use for the images of like, you know, we'll say like an Ultimate Warrior or just the outlandishness of some of the people like Papa Shango and shit like that. Like, is that something that has kind of influenced you as well or maybe kind of? It's weird. Like um, <clears throat> I mean, I liked wrestling when I was a kid. It was on on Saturday nights or sa Sunday mornings and stuff like that. Uh, but never really paid attention to it too much um, until Overcast did our first U.S. tour with uh, bands Disembodied and Shy Halud, okay. um, 1998. And it seemed like every time we would leave a venue and go to someone's house to like, you know, because you wouldn't get a hotel room that back then. You would just <laughs> crash at somebody's house on the floor. Um, every time we go to a house disembodied would put on WCW and they'd be doing the replays of thunder. And, and it just seemed like it was always on. And, um, I went from saying, Oh God, is this on again to <laughs> Holy crap. I can't wait to see if Hogan uh, is going to win the belt tonight. And, um, you know, the NWO type of stuff was pretty fun back then, but, um, yeah, I kind of got into it then around 98 and then sort of lost it a little bit and really wasn't a fan of the superhero wrestling guys. Okay. And then all of a sudden, uh, 12 o'clock midnight, one night I was sitting on my couch. I turned on um, Univision and ECW was on and I couldn't believe the carnage that was happening. And I was <laughs> laughing. I was like, this isn't a wrestling match. There's no rules to this. Why are, why is a million people coming out beating up this guy? I'd, I don't get this mugging. I, I just couldn't figure it out. <laughs> and that's what I loved about it, that you couldn't figure out where it was coming from and that it wasn't your normal everyday wrestling uh, that I was used to seeing. So I fell in love with ECW right away and kind of didn't like any of the other wrestling at all. So I strictly watched ECW and then I would go to the ECW shows they played in. Uh, they did a lot of shows in like in Worcester and mm -hmm. Revere and, and, and stuff around Massachusetts. So I'd go whenever I could and you just go and have the best time and blow out your voice from yelling so much. And it was just the, everyone in the crowd was as important as people on the stage or in the wrestling ring. And that's what I really liked about that. And that's kind of, you know, the sort of the theme behind kill switch too just like everyone's involved everyone's having fun it's not just us it's you guys too and let's make a party together type of thing and, um i started watching wwf and wcw because all the ecw guys started jumping shit and going over there and then you know um you know mr monday night was born rvd That'll and all that fun stuff so i kind of had to start watching it i really hated the storylines i didn't like how WWF and WCW would treat you like you were 10 and you know, all the unbelievable crap that was going on. I would, I would just scoff at, but I wanted to see my favorite wrestlers do their thing. So eventually ECW died and WWF bought it out and turned it into something really garbagey and crappy. Um, and then I just turned into a WWE guy, I guess. <laughs> Ipso facto. <laughs> now I'm a WWE guy, but um, there's such better wrestling out there. These there days. is, uh, there is tons better. Within the past couple of years, man, some of the best wrestling has has happened uh, that I've ever seen. Next to ECW stuff, I mean, Lucha Underground is amazingly fun to watch. It's on Netflix now. Anybody can watch it at any time. Um, they don't call it a wrestling show, but it's it's entertainment. It's really really fun. It's one of my favorite things to watch. Next to New Japan which um, almost every match that they have on New Japan is uh, what you say, uh, what you call a slobber knocker. <laughs> Jim Ross speak. Um, so much fun to watch. Kenny Omega, Okada, um, Naito. I love Naito. He's one of my favorite wrestlers right now. And um, there's other things, which is really cool. And I feel like WWE's got a little pressure on them right now to – be a little bit faster in the ring. I'm not a fan of slow, plodding, moving, safe wrestling. I mean, I want wrestlers to be safe, but I can't <laughs> stand watching safe wrestling. It just yeah. bores me to tears. 
I'm, I've kind of checked out of main product uh, WWE at this point, just because everything, some of the storylines that are going on right now, I feel like are rushed. Like they could have slow burned the the Shield reunion for a lot longer, and it blew up in their face. Yeah, because yeah. Roman Reigns is not with the company right now because the meningitis scare. So yeah, that's really weird. <laughs> they they rushed it and rushed it and rushed it to get it going, and they kind of blew some really good um, pops that they could have had by doing it a little bit slower. And now Roman Reigns is in there, so it kind of ruins the whole deal. I don't know. They they back themselves into a corner way too often, and it's very evident that. Some people shouldn't be writing for that show that are writing for the show. <laughs> it's funny as you get older, being a wrestling fan, and instead of being like, oh, I hate this person because I just don't like them. And now you're like, fuck, man, the writers are fucking this up, and I hate the writers. <laughs> the, the talent on WWE is the best in the world. That should be the best show going, and it's not because of these wrestlers trying to make things work that just are so stupid. <laughs> it doesn't make sense to me. You agree? Oh, I totally agree. I mean... Yeah. The fact that they already were already back into Kevin and Sami Zayn part, version three. Yeah, I the love second... Kevin Owens though. No, I, I do think too, Kevin but... Owens can do no wrong. He's he is one of my favorites on that program. Uh, AJ Styles as well. Even with the Good soccer stuff. mom haircut. <laughs> yeah. I loved him since TNA. Um, you know, I, I used to go to TNA uh, whenever I'd be in Florida. My parents lived down there, and and I would go with my dad and stuff and. That was a really fun show 10 years ago. You know, they were, they were really on to something. RVD was there and, you know, AJ Styles and Samoa Joe. And they, they really had some great talent. They just couldn't do much. They either. actually had the even worse writers in WWE, <laughs> if that's possible. Um, so kind of speaking of, of, it's funny you kind of mentioned like just shitty writing and stuff like that. Something I've kind of been wondering upon looking through your vast uh, work in graphic design between album covers, seven inches. Did he writing? So forth. What was that? Did he writing? <laughs> no. <laughs> um, was that, uh, you know, you, you have a style that's it's very you at this point. Like, I don't think you can see, like, I remember when Kyle kind of was, Kyle Baltus from 36, uh, when he was talking about their new record and when I did an interview with him a while back. And I had kind of, off the record had asked him like if you were doing the album artwork again for this one and he was like uh, i can't say yes but i can't say no infer what you will from that and so it's been kind of interesting to see you work with so many bands and you have such a style that even if i didn't know that it was yours like that you had done it like i know it's yours like when tyler joel's brother sent me the artwork for their ep city of homes i was like did mike d do this or did you find someone who like <laughs> and copy Mike D style like pretty good. And he goes, oh no, we had Mike D do it. And I go, oh, okay, that, well that makes sense. But like I just knew, like I knew looking at your art, like the work that it was yours. And hopefully it's not too samey. Hope you're, ho hopefully no, you're not thinking. But it, the it's... thing, the thing that's interesting to me though is in a, in a day and age where I think it's hard to make something and stand out, especially in a in a medium where it's easy to have people imitate what you do. I mean, we'll correlate it to music. It's easy to. It's hard to be groundbreaking and do something that hasn't been done. But then when the when the formula has been proven that it works, then you get people going like, well, fuck, I'm just going to start doing this because people like this. So I'd imagine it's very much the same with art. Like it probably was hard to do some of the mixed medium stuff that you were doing and incorporating and then having it be successful. So I was kind of wondering, were you always kind of after your own style in light of, you know, we'll even use the wrestling or skateboarding stuff like so many people doing their own thing and just kind of doing it because it fit them. Was it something that you were always were trying to very hard, like very cognizant of trying to do your own thing? Or was it just kind of a happy accident upon working? Well, graphic design is a lot of copying, copying other people's artwork, trying to get better at it, and then putting your own spin on it. Um, you know, there's very few uh, original ideas out there. So I just try to make the best thing that I could. And I really like getting involved in a project and building it from the ground up taking photos, make, getting a project, going to Michael's and picking up a heart like I did for End of Heartache that was made out of styrofoam, painting it, sticking nails in it, uh, dipping my girlfriend's hands into red paint and then doing a photo shoot in our bathroom that was uh, like a four by five <laughs> tiny, tiny little bathroom. But that's what's fun about stuff like that is just kind of trying it. And if it doesn't work, oh, well, maybe I'll try it again the next day. But you know, you take photos from every single different angle and try to get as much 
out of it as you possibly can so that maybe there's one good photo or two good photos of it was really fun with um um disarm the descent uh, i bought a little kid's wedding dress and lit it on fire in my backyard and <laughs> <laughs> and uh, just took photos of doilies getting burned up in this fire pit. And what did your neighbors think of that? <laughs> well, because I'm not an illustrator, so I do have faith that I know how to take a good photo, or at least I can get one photo. If I'm shooting three hundred thousand, I can at least get one good one. Um, and so I just use my strengths, which is photography to build my stuff. And maybe that's the reason why some things look more similar than others because it's all my own photography from around the world and stuff that I, that through my eyes, that's what I see. And maybe, uh, maybe it's similar. I don't know, but, um, I never really wanted, I don't know. Everyone wants to get their own style, but I never really set out to do that. I just wanted to copy Travis Smith. He's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> it's one of my favorites. Um, and speaking of kill switch album covers, I actually tried to find this answer, so if you've been asked this a ton, uh, please forgive me. On the self-titled, the, the first self-titled, uh, Live or Just Breathing and As Daylight Dies, uh, there's an emphasis on one of the eyes uh, on the cover image, always kind of having something going on with it. Like on the self-titled, I think one was kind of like at a little bit of an image around it. Uh, Daylight Dies, like one of the eyes has like a light coming from it and so forth. Like was that, what is the meaning behind that? Because I, I kind of have tried to figure out if there's a correlation to it at all or if anything else you've done, but I know at least on those three records, like that's something that's kind of present on each one. Yeah. I don't know. I like, I, I feel like eyes are windows to the soul and it's sort of like a look inside someone. Maybe, um, maybe I just ran out of ideas. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I just thought, uh, it fit. I don't know. I just thought it fit really. Okay. I didn't know if there was like more to it than that. Like something like, cause I mean with the, with those albums and, and in particular, like, you know, with the sort of the, uh, like the, like the face that you had used consistently throughout the album covers, I wasn't sure if eventually it was just kind of like a slow morph into what would become kill Switch's sort of like logo band logo at this point. Uh, and it was just yeah, kind of everything like a, seems, everything seems to morph into one thing, into another thing, into another thing. And I keep tweaking, 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 and then moving along. So, if you look at a lot of the logos that we have throughout the years that you can see the little tweaks going on and, and building to something different uh, based on not having any better ideas. <laughs> um, I think kind of one of the last kill switch focused questions I'll ask as far as the graphic design. So for your seven inch that you guys did for record store day a couple years ago, you ended up making the logo into a stencil. I don't know if anyone's ever actually, I mean, first of all, if you take that out of there, Ooh. that's a pain in the ass to get fucked back in. So I've, <laughs> yeah. I only made that mistake once and uh, I have not opened and taken it out since. <laughs> uh, but I've been wondering, was the intent to have people use it as a stencil or was it just something kind of fun since you guys haven't really done like a cut? Out? I don't think you've done really much cut out design work for anything. <laughs> That was the first one I'd ever done and I wanted to see if I could do it. And it was a lot harder than I thought it would to see if everything could connect. And obviously there's some really thin lines there that I could have made a little bit better. Um, but the idea was we had had this design that looked like a spray paint on the shirt. And I thought, oh, it'd be really cool if people could create their own spray paint design of our thing. And we were going to do the seven inch anyway. So I figured it was a really good opportunity to try something new. Have you seen, has anyone actually that you've seen used it as a stencil? No, I've always wanted to. I haven't gotten around to it either. <laughs> <laughs> I just don't want to ruin my one copy. <laughs> uh, no, I got an extra copy so I could do it and I still haven't done it yet. Fair enough. Um, so you had kind of talked about how you take a lot of ph ph photographs to kind of basically have a library of different probably textures and, and just ideas. Mm -hmm. So with all the travels that you do, do you think that, given the fact of your design work as a whole has allowed you to look at the world around you completely different than you think most people do? Like, do you think you notice a lot of smaller details that probably go unnoticed? I think that started with skateboarding. When you look out the window and you're a skateboarder, you see all sorts of things that you could be doing rail slides on or that you could, uh, you know, something looks like a ramp. You're like, Oh man, that'd be fun to skateboard on. Or I don't know. I was already, I think when I was, you know, 
13, I was already looking at things a completely different way than most people or at least looking at it like a skateboarder and uh, that has since passed on. And yeah, I can look at a bunch of stuff. I, I always have um, Josh, for instance, um, my guitar tech will say, oh, look at this cool thing. Look at this. You want to take you probably want to take a photo of this. And I'll look at it and know immediately. No, I, mean, <laughs> I can't use that for anything. But uh, then I'll look, you know, to the right and there'll be like a dead chipmunk or something and i'll know oh okay wait a minute that one i'll use um yeah i guess it's just the eye of the uh the artist i suppose but i i I like to buy actually um a lot of like halloween plastic skulls and stuff to have uh, a plethora of stuff to take photos of later on down the road maybe throughout the year um i've accumulated many plastic skulls (laughs) <laughs> that doesn't sound creepy at all. <laughs> um, also, I think in I think it was April you did your first art show. I did. Yeah, it was weird. Um, my buddy has you know, he uh, works at a bar called Knuckleheads in Connecticut, and he asked me he wanted to start doing um, what the heck was it called? I can't even remember the name of it, but he wanted to start doing the art shows and he would do one every couple months or something like that. And, and I was the first one and, and I had never done it before. So it was really trial and error of blowing up a lot of stuff that I had and, and getting it printed out. And, um, it seemed to be a success. All proceeds went to, um, a pug rescue, pug rescue of new England and, um, sold a bunch of stuff and gave a lot of money away. It was neat. Is it something you would entertain the idea of doing again or even doing prints for sale maybe off of your website? Well, the thing is with, with all my stuff, uh, I kind of sign away the rights. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't really Whenever you do <laughs> album artwork, you're not supposed to ever use it again. So I was kind of biting my nails when I was doing that um, art show that I wouldn't get yelled at by somebody. Um, <laughs> and I didn't, thankfully. But yeah, you're not supposed to do that stuff. So I would never sell any of that stuff. That's I And I don't. I don't care about money. Fuck it. <laughs> I'd rather just give it away, but whatever. Okay. Well, that was kind of the, the general consensus of uh, just graphic design stuff. I figured there's other things I know about you that I thought would be a little more fun to just bullshit about for a little bit. Yeah. Given the fact that Halloween is, what, a day away now at this point? It is. And I think it's safe to say you're a, you're a pretty avid horror movie fan as well. I am. So... What's one of the more, yes, we actually, uh, so I work for a screen printing company uh, here in Grand Rapids that makes shit for like Zoomies and PacSun and just basically shitty mall clothes. Um, And we just redid that shirt, uh, but it's called Return of the Living Dab and it's a fucking, the zombie instead of just coming out of the grave is dabbing and spray painting. Oh Oh, yeah, it's terrible. And then Diamond (laughs) Diamond Company is doing a bunch of uh, like misfit inspired shit like died diamond diamond my darling and shit like that and you're just like oh, hmm. what the fuck but yeah. regardless um what has been one of the more recent movies to come out horror wise that you've uh thought was pretty good in a day and age where people have no good ideas <laughs> right um it follows i thought was pretty awesome really creepy um i thought get out was done really really well that could have gone so wrong <laughs> yeah i thought it was perfect i thought it was great i have can't you... believe that was that dude's first movie ever have you heard about what the original ending was supposed to be? No. That apparently, spoilers, fuck it, I don't care. The movie's been out for a while. Uh, that apparently when the police show up, the main character was going to get arrested. And that's pretty much how the movie ends. Oh, uh, that would have been a downer. I love the way it ends. <laughs> I, I love the lines in the car. Yeah. Where the guy's just like, I told you so. Yeah. Don't hang around with white people. I thought it was fucking awesome. Uh, what else? Um, Cabin in the Woods was amazing. I think the best remake horror movie ever made is the newest Evil Dead remake. It is the bloodiest, goriest thing I've seen in a long time. If you don't like it, watch it again. No, it's not that I don't like it. There, okay. there were a few parts that kind of had me a little like, meh. But towards the end, when yeah, yeah, yeah. cutting her hand off and that and part was gnarly as fuck. Like even I was like, how much longer can you just extend this one scene? <laughs> Yeah, there, I mean, every horror movie is going to have stuff where you're just like, that's ridiculous. Uh, the fact that he buries her for like a second and then digs her up and the curse is over, it was pretty stupid too. But <laughs> the rest of the movie is is so 
gory and awesome. Um, I turned it on for a friend the other day and forgot just how gory it was. And he asked me to turn it off because he said he didn't want nightmares. <laughs> this is a kid. This is a guy in his 40s. So I was like, oh, I forgot how gory this was. I, That's uh, a really good one. I, I recommend that one highly. We actually just, uh, it's on Netflix. I think it's one of their originals. It's called The Babysitter. Oh, yeah. They keep flashing the advertisements for that every time I go on Netflix. It's, uh, it's a fun horror comedy type thing. Uh, hmm. there, there's nothing that you're going to be like, oh, I didn't see that coming. But mm -hmm. it, it actually, that's almost to its strength. Like there were times watching a movie, I'd be like, well, this is going to happen clearly. And mm. then it's like, then it happens. You're like, oh, that was a little more enjoyable than I, <laughs> I thought it was going to be since I called it. But, but I mean, most horror movies are like that anyways. It's, it's pretty hard to, I thought Get Out really came from a totally different angle and it follows as well. Just uh, very surprising things going on there. With uh, with some of the traveling you guys get to do, I don't know if you're into like foreign films at all. Uh, not as much as Josh is. <laughs> I uh, when on my trip to Denver a couple of months ago, we were at some like kind of dive bar, and I don't remember what it was called, but they were just running movies in the background, and they had Train to Busan or Busan or however you pronounce that. Mm -hmm. On, have you seen that? It's like a no. Japanese zombie movie. Do you have to read subtitles? Yep, I didn't. Nope. I had. <laughs> well, I was gonna say I couldn't. The sound wasn't on at the bar. So all I could do was just watch it and read oh, the okay. subtitles. Then that's easier. But. And I was completely engrossed for like the whole movie. Oh. Uh, but it's it was one that I thought was a, a pretty solid watch, given the fact that I watched it in a bar listening to punk rock music while reading Japanese subtitles. I I really suck at reading. I, my comprehension is very low and my ADD just constantly, I'm thinking about other projects I could be doing or uh, reading just seems like slow motion to me. Um, so and especially if I'm watching anime where a million things are happening at once, it's hard for me to read and watch at the same time. Sometimes I have to watch it two and three times just to really figure out what the heck's going on. So I didn't do too well in school. <laughs> I was going to ask if you actually are into anime or graphic novels at all. Not reading. Um, <laughs> audiobooks. I love audiobooks. Um, I got pretty much every Stephen King audiobook known to man at this point. Um, I love throwing on an audiobook or listening to Howard Stern or listening to um, a cool, creepy podcast. Um, Beyond the Darkness, I really like. Coast to Coast, I listen to a lot. And uh, just, you know, creating stuff while listening to people talk about crazy ghost stories. It's fun. What, uh, has there is there a horror movie poster that stands out to you as being like one of the most like an icon? Well, other than maybe the one you're wearing on your shirt, but because uh, I always think like it's interesting, like back in the the 80s and such, like the the thought that went into creating posters for horror movies, the way they would tie in something that happens or whatever. Right. I mean, there's definitely a difference between people who who hand draw and illustrate these things with you know paint them rather than people who just do it on a, a computer. Uh, the first Freddy Krueger poster is pretty fantastic i love looking at, at the intricacies that are going on in that one um I, one of the newer ones i thought was done really well even though it's a little too photoshoppy was the newest day of the dead that has a lot of zombies coming at you and then they're melting at the bottom i just i really love that one i thought the first po the poster for the first um resident evil i thought was done really well as well it's just like an eyeball um, oh yeah I kind of forgot I about that. That was movie. done pretty neat. And obviously, uh, Return of the Living Dead poster is one of the best ones out there. <laughs> it is it is pretty interesting. It and it's funny in doing some of the, the shirt designs we've done, I didn't realize how many fucking like half tones and shit are going on in these these prints, and you're just like, no one's gonna even notice that this like sort of orange red's even in there because it's too close <laughs> to it, like a, a normal color. Yeah. But, it's uh, it's interesting. I think I've kind of taken that away from that job is just kind of seeing how much goes into the coloring and like the half tones and the layering of stuff to make an image look like it. It can like make it. your brain explode. There's so much going on like that. Yeah. Well, it's when I have like, I think the crazier thing is having three to five seconds to look at something and then try to find the flaw in it if there is one <laughs> mm -hmm. and then pass it through. Uh, Even harder is trying to take something that's a half tone and make it back into a regular <laughs> image and then half tone it again and not yeah. get a more A. That's pretty yeah. Uh, wild. Yeah, it's it's interesting. <laughs> and there's so much shit that people are just not even going to give a shit about. They're like, no, it's cool. And you're like, damn. <laughs> um, kind of going a little bit back to, to wrestling as well. You were able to work with WWE, shit, probably over 10 years ago at this point, uh, to work on 
uh, a song. And I don't know, was the song actually meant to always be a theme song or did they just approach you to to write something for a general use? The idea was, well, what the story that was told to me was that Randy Orton specifically asked for us to create his theme song. And uh, little did I know, but the WWE was going out and finding other bands uh, to put on a soundtrack that they were going to do. I think it's called something... in aggression something aggression yeah and shadows falls on there and um brand new sin who who did the uh paul white uh big show <laughs> theme song which he still uses to this day um so randy orton wanted us to do his theme song and we were kind of stoked that he was a fan and that we had the opportunity to do something with wwe and um so we so that what they do is they send you a song and they're like you can either cover this or just throw lyrics on top of it. Um, but we, we're going to own the song no matter what. And you're kind of like, okay. So they sent us this awful song. One of the most terrible things. Howard and I, Howard was in the band at the time. We're huge wrestling fans. And the rest of the guys were like, we can't do anything with this pile of shit. We don't even <laughs> want to do anything with wrestling at all. Um, get out of here. <laughs> Pretty much. Uh, but Howard and I kept pushing and pushing and pushing. And it led down the road to... One day we showed up at practice and the guys are like, okay, we have one hour to make this song work. And if not, we're not going to do it. And we came up with um, something that we all enjoyed and that we were going to be comfortable putting out to the world. So uh, we recorded that song. We And Randy Orton used it for one day. <laughs> and fans wrote in and said, change the song back. We hate that song. So after one day, our song got taken off and the old Randy Orton song got put back on. So I thought immediately, Oh, well, okay, well we got one Monday night thing. <laughs> it's about all, uh, one Monday night show. Sorry. Someone's trying to call me for some reason. Okay. And, um, and then all of a sudden it showed up as, as a pay-per-view song for, I think a judgment day pay-per-view. And that was really, really cool. Cause they play your song every five minutes, you know, on a pay-per-view. Um, <laughs> So it was just neat, you know, a little bit more exposure to the wrestling world and stuff. And the band was still kind of growing at that point. So it was uh, cool that people kind of liked the song. And then it went away for a while. And all of a sudden I heard they were bringing back ECW and that there was going to be somebody who's going to use our song on ECW. And I remember watching the show and seeing CM Punk come out to our song. And I thought it was really cool that like a hardcore punk guy would be using our song since we were sort of a hardcore metal band anyways. And we all came from hardcore backgrounds. So it was very fitting. And it was one of the few things where I was like, wow, that, that really makes sense to me. So he used it for six or seven years. And uh, about two years before he stopped using it, he, uh, we had talked to him a bunch of times. He did some interviews with us and stuff like that. His name is Phil and um, CM Punk is who I'm talking about. And, uh, He's like, he, he asked Howard if we could do a cover of Cult of Personality because he wanted to go heel and change up everything. And we had always, always in the back of our mind said, okay, we could probably do something like that. But we were on a major touring schedule at the time and just never got around to it. So he, he had uh, asked us and we said yes and then could never proceed to make him his second song. So he just used the regular Cult of Personality, which is probably better off. <laughs> and um so he used that and then our song kind of went away into never neverland it's still in the video games though as a usable theme oh is it oh, i know, I know one... in uh 2k let's see they're on 2k 18 now i think 2k 16 i know i used it as my creative characters uh intro oh right on I, man i'm so terrible at those button pushing games you need to know oh, so many different sucks codes now. and stuff the still the best game still has always been uh and sub and ah wcw nwo revenge it's probably still mm. one of my favorite video games anybody uh, could beat me i'm so bad at it <laughs> um but one of the cool the coolest story i know about that cm punk song was that phil cm punk told me that the first time he locked up with randy orton randy kind of crouched into his ear and said give me my song back <laughs> i thought that was fucking cool as hell i find it amusing that phil CM Punk and, and Randy Orton are tied over the use of your song, considering <laughs> how many other projects WWE would give one and then give give to Punk and then give to Randy Orton. Like he 
I think on Cole Cabana's podcast talked about how he was supposed to go on Ink Master, not Ink Master, on uh, LA Ink to go get a tattoo by Dan Smith since they were friends and it was going to be a good cross promotion type thing. And then last minute they subbed in Randy Orton to get sleeves of skulls and shit. And that's how oh. like that all started. Hmm. So it's funny to me that, uh, that Randy Orton basically you were going to do the song for someone and ended up with him and then went to, to CM Punk knowing that there's kind of a weird back and forth with some of the shit that WWE has done with those two over I the years. I guess I didn't know that. Yeah. Huh. That's strange. Cause they're totally not the same wrestler at all. They don't have the same look. Nope. They don't have the same style. Nope. Um, yeah. One's an ego maniacal <laughs> maniac and then another one's kind of a pretty down to earth kind of guy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, speaking more of theme songs. And so if you could do, a theme song for a wrestler now who who would you want to to do a theme for if they approached you hmm i would do it for anybody really um i just think it's great exposure we're actually um, i'm not even supposed to talk about it but we have two wrestling theme songs in the works right now one i believe is finished well, you guys have been and, posting uh, about it and the sites have picked up on it. So Yeah. Okay. Well, that that one, the first one is done. And then the second one, we are going to start recording in like two weeks. We just, uh, one's for one company and then the other one is for <laughs> WWE. And uh, the WWE one was really complicated because it was another thing where they sent us a song and said, you need to cover this as best as possible or as close as possible. And it's not a good song. <laughs> so we had a, we had a tough time with it, and a lot of the dudes were just like, "I don't want to do this," and I get it. I I understand if it's a really crappy song, we got to put our name on it. We don't want our fans thinking we wrote something terrible. Um, so we got this song to where we're comfortable, and uh, we're going to start recording it soon. Do you think uh, Code Orange getting on NXT recently? Do you think that's that's a good look to kind of help maybe get a lot more of of people within your in the realm of what you guys are doing, a better look to get on some of these more mainstream avenues like that, that, you know, obviously I know that, uh, a lot, interestingly enough, a lot of touring band people are, are really into wrestling, which is something I've kind of learned over the handful of years. Uh, no one I them. tour with, <laughs> nobody I know likes it except for code orange. Like I would always have conversations with those dudes. We tour with them a bunch and, and every time I get in a room with them, we'd talk wrestling and how they always wanted to get a theme song on WWE. And all of a sudden they're on NXT, like a pay-per-view. And they're starting the pay-per-view. I couldn't have been happier. I felt like a proud papa with those guys on there. And, and um, it's strange that WWE went away from it for a long time. Because it seems like that 10 years ago compilation that they did uh, seemed like a cool avenue for them to explore. And they just kind of dropped it like you know a hot potato. Um, and now they're sort of getting back into it. So I, I hope it is uh, sets precedent for the future. And I hope that they do combine a lot of that stuff. It's a great way to uh, get new fans, I think. Yeah, it's if, it's just I do remember that uh, that e that album you're talking about. And it seemed like, you know, with Disturbed doing Stone Cold's theme, a take on it. And a did handful, they? Yeah. 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 <laughs> I, I want know. the old Stone Cold theme. Sorry. Well, I mean, like when you have like, an, it was just too much wah <laughs> yeah. going on. Uh, so, kind of jumping ship a little bit, we already kind of talked about vinyl. Crap beer, me living here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and obviously having founders, and we have Bells and just a slew of other crap, crap beer places uh, popping up everywhere. There seems to kind of be a, a, an interesting cross promotion as well between getting artists to do labels uh, for beer bottles and such and, and collab uh, collaborating with bands to do beers and so forth. And you guys even recently just put out a, I believe it was an IPA, wasn't it? For your yes, library just yep. reading? For uh, Cigar City Brewing Company in Tampa, Florida. Yeah, it was really fun. Um, I, I had known those guys before because I did some labels for uh, a band called Sam Black Church who was an old Boston band that kind of came back from the dead and they, they started playing shows again and came out with a beer. So I did the label for the can and the bottle. And then uh, these guys kept asking us if we wanted to do one, which is something we've always wanted to do. And uh, Adam kind of took the reins and, and uh, I believe there's cranberries and pine needles in the beer, but it's way smoother than you might think. Uh, IPAs to me are kind of bitter 
and more like a Starbucks coffee, like a burnty, <laughs> I don't know, dandelion tasting. Um, so I'm not pers. I like the shittiest beer you can find. Um, you know, Coors Light, <laughs> Bud Light, anything light is is my jam. I just like things that you can drink really fast. <laughs> I don't like these sipping beers. Uh, but I don't no. need to make love to my beer. <laughs> I was going to say, what's been interesting, though, like I know uh, Dogfish had out of actually out of Delaware hooked up with uh, Jermaine Rogers, who does a lot of uh, band posters and stuff. That's how he's kind of gotten popular. And even to the point of like founders, like getting with some local artists to help with creating labels, I wanted to kind of because I know basically it was just a, a smaller variation of the Alive or Just Breathing album cover as a whole. Right. And we, and we tried to combine them with the with the release of the vinyl, tried to do a cross promotion thing. Yeah. But what I was kind of getting to, and I know like you do a lot of stuff for your the band's singles, and it's interesting to kind of think of the work that you probably put into creating a design that ends up on a very small, small thing, whether it be a beer bottle or even in this case, sometimes of like a seven inch or whatever, it's in a way smaller medium than perhaps you even were anticipating, or even since most people don't buy anything uh, on a small screen, like yay big, is it kind of... Is it kind of hard to, to get excited about something knowing that it's going to be like on a, a small ass little thing that no one's really going to pay attention to? Or do you kind of it's, just go ahead? It is exciting. I love doing anything new, anything that uh, challenges the way I perceive a project. Um, beer balls are super fun to do. Um, gives me a chance to brush up on my illustrator skills and make vector art rather than uh, Photoshop art, which is uh, I've. I used to be a, I don't know if this is nerd talk, but uh, Aldous Freehand was my jam when it came to vector <laughs> programs. And uh, within the past four or five years, I've gotten into Illustrator and I love it. And I love the live trace feature where you can take any of your artwork and turn it into a vector and then work on it from there. So I really dove into that and I loved diving, uh, grabbing the old Alive or Just Breathing artwork and boiling it down to the bare essentials. Uh, taking away all the extra crap and making just the image as stark as possible. And I feel like that's what I did. And then turning it into a vector and, and arranging it into um, whatever parameters the template calls for. Um, I, I, I love it. I think it's fun. I could do designs for a funeral home and have a good time. <laughs> I, I love anything that's different. It's, it's funny. That's actually the name of the company I work for is Vector, Vector Distribution. Oh, Nice. So, and, and yeah, that's it's like the tongue in cheek kind of like eh, it also applies to what we do. And people, so I'm sure you use a lot of Illustrator then. I don't, oh, okay. <laughs> but I'm sure we do as a as a as a company. Mm -hmm. Um, so would you guys want to do another beer? Perhaps I mean Deftones at this yeah. point have two beers out. I know that they said they're releasing another one for around now, uh, and I think they had kind of made the comment that they want to almost do one per per season, uh, hmm. and do four total. I guess. Would you Greedy guys be bastards? I mean, I have two of them, two of each of the ones they put out any, sitting on my are shelf. They any good? I haven't had them yet. Uh, okay. Coincidentally, I was supposed to do a podcast with Brock when they were here in Lansing, and we were gonna drink a bunch of different beers and just talk about <laughs> it. Uh, but never really got around to that. So I'm still saving them for a decent occasion to actually bust one open. I'm afraid they're gonna be good, and I'm gonna want to drink the other one. Right, right. Well, you should do. Uh, we have this thing on tour. It's called Start the Clock. Okay. And what you do is you, you say, start the clock with everybody around you. And then you, you drink your beer. And every 45 minutes as you're drinking, you take a photo, take a photo, take a photo. And as the night progresses, it gets funnier and funnier and funnier. <laughs> I wonder if maybe you could do a podcast where every 45 minutes you turn on the computer and you can see yourself live and how – how twisted you're getting and then <laughs> turn it off and turn it on and turn it off and then cut it into one little segment. I bet your fans would love that. I know I would. I, I don't have fans really at this point. <laughs> I, it's, it's been funny. I was making the comment today on Twitter. I was like, oh, I because I finally announced it like I was doing a chat with you. And a few people were like, wow, that's a really good get. And I was like, yeah, I don't know how I fucking get anybody because if anyone were to really be like, what's your reach? I'd be like, I don't have one. <laughs> yeah. And the people that do listen to it that I get positive feedback from, they're just like, I was like, I know it's totally whoever I'm talking to. It's not me, but it is what it is. Um, All you can do is try, right? No, and just I just, I have try fun. Pave your own way. Fuck it. If, if it's good enough, people will rise to the occasion and check it out, you know? 
No, I just have fun talking to people about fun shit and try to find a different avenue to, to talk on that isn't necessarily everything that you talk about for the last 10, 15 years in interviews. <laughs> um, kind of the last two questions, or actually three. Um, so tattoos. I know like I have a bunch, but uh, over the last handful of years, I've noticed you've been working on your sleeves because uh, for a while, you, I think you were rocking like a quarter sleeve for it seemed like forever. And <laughs> uh, I was wondering as someone who's, creative in your own own rights how hard is it to how hard was it to kind of figure out what you wanted to get pretty tough it, it's more a matter of finding someone that you trust that can create something that you're going to be happy with and you don't have to needle around with oh can you change that can you change this I, are I, you uh, good about giving up giving that up though because i feel like freedom yeah. yes are you okay. unless it's something totally stupid that needs to be fixed but um <laughs> i really can't come up with anything for myself i just have ideas and i'll give them to the artist and uh the people who i use i i usually trust pretty well and um i like i like other people's opinions i like collaborating with artwork and and using other people's drawings like uh the newest kill switch record um we had uh, someone draw the cover and I d colored it and, um, and did all the backgrounds and stuff like that. I think it's fun to take someone else's artwork and use it or, or to have someone draw something for you and not be so heavy handed with the uh, art direction. Just let people do their thing. But, um, you know, I had, I got a tattoo just as I turned 18 and got, tattoos you know a couple years after and then just fell off the train for about 15 years <laughs> just because i the ones i got were so bad <laughs> it's like i don't know i don't want another bad one so if i don't find an artist that i appreciate or like i just won't get one so it took me a while to find a few people that i trust and now i have a couple guys that i really like uh dave pool out of uh, rockabilly tattoo in fort lauderdale did most of my sleeves and uh vic back uh, of salt lake city 27 tattoo um has done a lot of other stuff for me he's a really good friend and occasionally he'll come out on tour with us and tattoo the band or tattoo anyone that wants to do it it's fun it is fun and then what's it like for you to see on the flip side of that what's it like for you to see some of the stuff that you've created get tattooed on people it's neat it's uh Sometimes they don't look so hot. <laughs> Sometimes they don't look so good and I just feel bad for the people, but it's, um, it's heartwarming to know that people like the image that much that they'll get it put on their body. That's a delicate way to say it, right? <laughs> yes. Yeah, it was... Uh, I ended up getting many, many years ago the a variation, the deluxe, or I think it was a special edition of the End of Heartache with the, like, the blossoms coming out of the... The image for the the reissue, I guess. Uh, was it a, a flower with nails in it? Blue yeah. flower with nails in it. Yep. Yeah. So I ended up getting a variation of that, and then the artist kind of took some extra liberties with it as well, with some colors. Okay. And it is what it is. And when it was fresh, it looked pretty good. But now, mm -hmm. over the years of being old, uh, not so much. Let's see it. Let's see it. It's on your butt, right? <sighs> no. That held up. It doesn't uh, look so bad. I bet you get that touched up. Yeah, I've thought about covering it up though. At the same, Could but it that. was funny when uh when you guys played Chicago on that Rise Against tour, Tyler ended up coming out, and then it's one of those I kind of forget a habit when you have so many after a while and have yeah. some for a long time. And we went to go meet up with him and and Joel at Reggie's, and I wasn't thinking much of it. And then Tyler starts pointing at it and laughing behind Joel, <laughs> and then I was like, "What are you? What are you pointing?" And I like look at my arms like, "Oh shit." Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I kind of kept trying to do this awkwardly, ah. like Leon stuff. <laughs> well, I'm honored that you liked it enough to get it tattooed. It's. I always wonder though, like it, you know, as a graphic design person, if you're always like, oh, this is kind of interesting. I would never create something for myself ever. I just don't appreciate. I guess I just I'm not, <laughs> I'm not a fan of my work as much as that to get something I've made put on me i mean eventually maybe there'll be like an overcast o or something random uh just detailing old bands that i've been in but uh i don't i don't think i could come up with artwork that would go on me i'd rather have somebody else do it <laughs> and then the last question i noticed your signature bass 
considering how much design work you do, I was I've always been surprised that there's really nothing to the base. Like the design is it's usually just a, a solid color. Well, um, Ibanez has been awesome to me. They're re one of my favorite sponsors. They're s they've always been really cool and um, always reached out to me as far as doing a signature series or something like that for them. And uh, the first one I did was a matte black with a glossy varnish. So that had a design on it. The second one I did, um, I had happened to go to NAM that year and I saw that people were doing computerized etching into wood. And I said, oh, what if I do an etched base? And um, Mike Taft, who is my contact over there, the A&R guy, was like, yeah, we'll never do that. And then like <laughs> two months later, I got a design in the mail on wood. And they're like, guess what? We can do this. So let's do it. Um, so uh, the th third incarnation of my, my base uh, was a destroyer, a black, uh, the Ibanez version of an explorer is the destroyer. And I just liked it because it looks like Gem and the Holograms crazy points <laughs> sticking all over the place. And it's Not really, crew for you. really fun to play and it sounds great. And um, I had mentioned what design I want on it. And they said, well, why don't we not do a design this time? It might be harder to sell uh, something with a design on it. Let's try just flat black this time. And I agreed. And then the new one, um, I just forgot about doing a design at that point because they, they really think that it's easier to sell things without a design on it. They like the inlay, the little kind of, I don't know, I, I made kind of an inlay star and they dig that enough and they think that's probably good enough. So that's what I, so it's just a kind of regular base these days, but I'm going to start doing some sort of couple color blends and different things to make it stand out. I think in the future, if they have me do another one. Should go all uh, Kirk Hammett and just start doing like a horror movie series, prints <laughs> and all this kind of stuff, and just have fun with your your bases. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> and uh, lastly, this is usually where uh, I have people plug their socials. You don't really have a ton. You just really have um, your your website and your Instagram. Yeah, I do Instagram, which is Dark Icon Design. Uh, I mostly do Instagram. I rarely do like a Facebook or any of that stuff. I have kind of a crappy rudimentary um, website for my design work. It's just so people can see samples, darkicondesign.com. Um, yeah, I don't know. I don't promote myself so well. <laughs> it's just kind of word of mouth and very and DIY. Like yeah. I think that's the I overall vibe of, of you is it, a DIY. If it's like, if it's somebody, if it's a band that I really like, I'll mention, oh, if you guys ever need artwork and then, you know, lay the groundwork for maybe a couple of years later, they'll call and, and we'll do something together, collaborate on something. Um, I like to not be super pushy when it comes to that stuff. I don't want to be like the used car salesman. And every time I walk in the room, people run for cover because they don't <laughs> want me to be asking about, you know, plug in my design business. So I just keep it real mellow and People come to me when they want stuff done and, and they don't when they don't. Um, it's really fun to work for labels though. Um, I've recently done a bunch of stuff for like Metal Blade and and do like three or four projects rather than just one big project. And it's cool to spread yourself out around. Yeah, word of mouth. And then I always end these with a song. So what is a song that you would like me to end this with? Hmm. And it doesn't, about... have, it doesn't have to be yours, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, it wouldn't be. Um, okay. I was on the plane the other, uh, yesterday flying back from a show that we just did in Denver. And for the, it's been a long time since I listened to Once Upon the Cross by Deicide. Okay. So if you want to play Children of the Underworld, that one's pretty awesome. Cool. We will nice end, uh, Halloween song. We will uh, end with that. Thank you for your time. And uh, hopefully you enjoy the rest of your day going to, what was it again? Like an, an opera or something? I'm doing. I'm going to um, Nightmare Before Christmas Symphony in at Boston in Boston tonight. So, Ooh, so all Danny Elfman stuff. Yeah, it should be pretty neat. I don't know. I've never been to a symphony before, but people told me to get super duper high and go, <laughs> and I'll have a better time. So, I made some baked goods, and we'll see how, how it goes. <laughs> that should be awesome. Are they going to play stuff like scenes in the background? Do you know? I think they're playing the movie. I don't. I think they are. We'll see. I'll. I don't know. Maybe I'll text you and let you know what happened. Awesome. I would actually like to know because that sounds actually sounds like a good time.
and it's a great movie and a great soundtrack so i don't see how it wouldn't be a good time if they were to put the visuals with the the audio yeah yeah we'll see we'll see i don't know awesome well i think uh we'll be seeing you on the i think rush and i are going to come see you guys in indianapolis uh on the second leg of the kilthrax tour oh cool February. yeah that starts up in january and it goes till may and it's hitting all the places that we haven't hit we didn't hit the last time we went out and we had such a fun time with those guys. They're really, really cool dudes, and we've we've known a few of them for a long time. John from Shadows Fall plays with them now, and we've known him forever. And um, it seems like a really good mix uh, of bands, us and those guys. They were always kind of one of those bands that didn't super take themselves seriously, and they had a lot of cartoon renditions of them, and they did, you know, I'm the Man and really funny stuff, and we try to not take ourselves super seriously. So we thought it would be a great ma- match and it, and it has been. And um, we wanted to do it again. So that's what's happening. And uh, a little more Canada this time. We kind of missed out on some Canada dates and there's a lot this time. So it's always fun going to Canada in the middle of January and getting your bus <laughs> frozen to the ground. <laughs> we'll see I think how that the, goes. Uh, I thought the craziest thing about seeing that tour for anyone that didn't see it or is looking forward to it, like I, when I was talking with Josh on this, was just the stage production that each of you had and how fast you were all able to work together to night in and night out to, to tear it, tear it down and get it set up. Like it was pretty impressive. Our and guys I, are good at that. Our guys are really, uh, they're awesome. They, they really want to be the best at this thing. Uh, this ca- called set changeover. They, they, uh, have it in them to be the best band on the tour, every tour. And, and that's not a bad thing to have be the best band to get shit off stage yeah why not it's makes it, you look cooler that's i for mean sure. for those uh who who haven't seen anthrax on this past tour they they definitely have a lot of shit to, <laughs> to move oh. so i mean at that point God, the fact that it was able shit. to move and get you guys on i think you actually were slightly ahead of schedule even by a couple minutes so it's our guys yeah <laughs> so uh very much looking forward to hopefully seeing you guys on that uh tour again in a couple months and uh enjoy your night thank you very much again cool thank you rock